on uh, behalf of uh, the press institute of india this is sachin aya extending to all of you a very warm welcome uh, uh, to to, uh, to today's discussion uh, which is very topical we are looking at the sri lanka crisis and uh, the impact of the crisis uh, on india lanka ties and uh, we will also try and look at the way ahead uh, i am particularly delighted to uh, to welcome our friends uh, from sri lanka uh, mr jahan perera mr mutulingam and uh, mr ishwaran ratnam thank you all for so readily agreeing to be a part of this program and for joining uh, uh, from colombo and candy uh, and a big hello of course uh, to professor surinarayan here in chennai and uh, uh, also arun janardhan from the indian express and uh, an old colleague of mine we've done several programs together on national security and foreign policy mr heblika who joins us from bangalore and last but not the least a warm welcome to mr ramakrishnan who uh, will of course moderate this program uh a year ago or perhaps even a few months ago few of us except perhaps the experts might have expected something like this a crisis both economic and political uh, uh to hit sri lanka it's in many ways a story of uh, the dramatic fall of the rajapaksas from sri lanka's most powerful political dynasty in decades perhaps and once considered heroes by many in the island nation reduced today to a family desperately trying to cling to power the slide of sri lanka's economy has been as dramatic shall we say it's been swift and painful and there are fears that things will only get worse before it begins to improve there are various questions is an imf bailout possible will such a bailout help the common people and more significantly can india lanka ties get closer and is there a prescription to overcome the crisis or is there a credible road map i think these are some of the questions or aspects that uh, will come to the fore as mr ramakrishnan steers this program forward uh before i hand it over to him let me just mention although we know him well to others who don't sir ramakrishnan i think 2022 marks his 30th year with the hindu if i'm not mistaken he's been a journalist with the hindu for 30 years now he's now associate editor and uh, a few years ago uh, the hindu had asked him to serve in colombo as uh, the sri lanka and maldives correspondent and during his stint in colombo uh, he has interacted with a wide range of people from different hues including the president the prime minister and tamil leaders and several of his articles from colombo have covered the status of life of those who got their lands back held by the sri lankan armed forces for years there have also been articles on the progress of implementation of the housing scheme funded by the indian government and the living conditions of who returned to northern province after living, after living in tamil nadu as refugees for years he's also written a number of articles on the hill country tamils one of the most neglected groups in sri lanka so mr ramkrishnan comes with a rich experience uh, in sri lanka and uh, he continues to follow events there closely he also writes articles on uh, 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 indo lanka ties etc and uh, he is i think uh, supremely qualified to moderate this discussion over to you mr ramakrishna thank you very much mr ramakrishna i think you're on mute I have been mute uh, right now yeah, okay yeah. fine please take over please take right. over uh, thanks sashi uh, for your uh, nice uh, kind remarks friends we are having the discussion here amid an unprecedented economic crisis in sri lanka and the prolonged protest by people in colombo and elsewhere 
a combination of uh, complex factors has contributed to the present situation in the country. As you all know, India has provided an assistance of over uh, 3 billion US dollars in getting addressed diverse needs of people and the government of Sri Lanka. It is against this background that the Press Institute of India is organizing this discussion on an important topic of the current times. I hope the speakers will also dwell upon temporary and permanent solutions that the Sri Lanka can have. I would uh, request the speakers, especially those from Sri Lanka to respond to a few of my questions also. One, what is the probability of the present uh, agitation or movement uh, acquiring the shape of a political entity, political organization. You would be aware that um, you know, in 2011 in Delhi, there was a protest by Anna Zare and all that. But then it was, uh, it was AAP, you know, Aam Admi Party, uh, that led to the birth of the Aam Admi Party. Whereas in 2017 in Chennai, you had this Jallikattu agitation, lakhs of people had converged on the Marina Beach. They were there for about a week or so uh, for this uh, Jallika to this uh, bullfight. You know, they thought that uh, that right had been taken away. Anyhow, but uh, that didn't uh, lead to any birth of any party, political party in Tamil Nadu. And then there are some similarities between the, uh, the what we are seeing on the golf face and uh, in Delhi or Chennai, uh, as it happened in Chennai, also people uh, in, there is uh, there is people in Colombo. They don't agitators won't, don't want to have any tie up, any you know uh, arrangement with political parties. So this, the, on, on the face of it, okay, they seem to be um, having aversion towards political established political parties. And then is an economic collaboration with the southern part of India. A feasible idea politically and even otherwise. So this is being talked about for quite some time. Uh, Ranil and then I think these days Harsha also speaks about it. And then uh, finally, is this an opportune moment for resolving or at least in making a serious bid to find a lasting solution to the ethnic problem? I will also, uh, uh, before I hand it over the first speaker, Dr. Jahan Pereira, I will finish all the introduction in the sense of all the speakers at one go, okay? And then, then I will hand it over to Dr. Jahan. Jahan wears many hats, a peace activist, a conflict resolution specialist, a product of Harvard, and the head of an institution that has been in existence for 27 years, National Peace Council. He's a commentator on a host of contemporary political and social issues concerning Sri Lanka. As one who enjoyed his hospitality, I have a great pleasure in inviting him to share his views on today's topic. Dr. Muthulingam is a founder of the 31-year-old uh, Institute of Social Development, Candy. He has uh, devoted himself to issues and problems concerning workers, especially those in plantations. Muthulingam participated in a socialist revolutionary movement for some years while serving as a representative of trade unions in Lanka General Services Union and the Workers and Patients Institute, which was founded by the veteran social, sociologist, Dr. Newton Gunasinghe. He had to under, go underground in the mid eighties when he spent some time in India. He runs a museum and archive in Paradeka, Kambola on the way to Nuvarelia for the community in a century old structure, which once housed workers' quarters. Third, Iswaran Ratnam. One of the three speakers, I think, if I am not wrong, is the youngest of them. But that doesn't make him in any way less accomplished than others. A leading journalist of Sri Lanka has been the managing editor of Colombo Gazette, the nonprofit website which has bagged several accolades. He has held various positions in different media organizations. At present, he's with the Daily Mirror and, uh, and in his, they, on his talk show, which is quite popular, he has been covering politicians of different hues. Mr. P.M. Heblika is the Managing Trustee, Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bangalore, former Special Secretary, Government of India, a specialist in insurgency and counterinsurgency in India's Northeast region, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Nepal. 
He has supervised China-related work and developments in South Asia and Southeast Asia. He is associated with several universities in India and overseas on issues of national security. He is a member of the board of directors of Asian Dialogue Society at Singapore. Professor Surya Narayan is the, so the uh, oldest hand as far as Sri Lanka is concerned and a long association with the Center for South and Southeast Asian Studies, University of Madras. He is with the two think tanks in Chennai, the Center for Asia Studies and Chennai Center for China Studies. He was a member of the international monitoring team which monitored the presidential election in Sri Lanka in 1999. And finally, and not the least, um, Arun Janathan. Arun is an assistant editor with the Indian Express based in Chennai. He has served other institutions as well. He has extensively covered Sri Lanka in the past seven years, including all major political and social events, Easter Sunday blasts, besides a series of interviews with prominent personalities of Sri Lanka. He has also written, uh, he is also a screenplay uh, writer and uh, his film uh, Ara Kriyam, a future film which was released in April 2021. So I now invite Dr. Jahan to inaugurate the discussion. Dr. Jahan? Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ramakrishnan. I'm, okay. I'm very pleased to be here and to uh, speak to you and also to hear from you. Um, actually, we are, I'm very pleased that you are, that I'm discussing this with Indians and with those from uh, Tamil Nadu. We are actually very grateful to India for the great assistance it is giving us in this difficult time. And we are very heartened by the response of the Tamil Nadu uh, government to uh, give all Sri Lankans, I mean, whatever aid that is being given, that they are prepared to give it to all Sri Lankans. I think those are very uh, positive uh, gestures. I mean, in the sense in what India has been giving is uh, giving not a gesture, it is real assistance to us. Uh, even today, you see, today is a Hartal day, but you will see huge lines uh, of people on the, on the road uh, waiting to, to get petrol and diesel or gas. I mean, it's very terrible to see this sight and the suffering that we have to undergo because it's really hot at this time. And to see people in their cars, like queuing up, lining up for a kilometer uh, is terrible, but it would have been much worse if, if not for the Indian support that we have been getting. Now, very briefly, I want to just say that the root cause of what has happened uh, I mean, also, I just want to refer to uh, what uh, Sashi said, that it was something that was not imaginable uh, a year ago. And I say, I, I, even we never imagined this to happen. Never thought that Sri Lanka would come to this very sorry pass. Uh, a year ago, maybe two years ago, we were being called an upper middle income country. And it seemed a little odd that Sri upper middle income, because of course, at the lowest level, like we had just passed the 4,000 US dollar per capita income. And that's where the upper middle income starts at 4,100 and we had just crossed that. So we were at the very lowest level of upper middle income, but it just didn't seem to be real because I mean, I have gone to other countries which are upper middle income and they are much, much more prosperous than us. So there was something wrong, but anyway, it gave us some pride that now we were upper middle income. But uh, so we never dreamt that this would happen to us. And also that the Rajapaksas, that they could be so uh, reviled as they are today. And that uh, little children should be shouting uh, that uh, the president is a rogue and uh, that he should go and Basil is a, a, something to do with the crow. Uh, and even in the schools now, they are, even I, I heard that even in the schools, these little children are shouting because these very catchy tunes uh, and catchy slogans. So they are shouting this even inside the schools. So it, it was something, I mean, unimaginable because uh, we saw the Rajapaksas. I mean, in a way, we knew that they were taking money and there was a lot of corruption. We knew that. But on the other hand, I, we thought, took it for granted that our people will continue to support them because of what they did. And 
because they, they were like a royal family, like kings in this country. And even now it's hard to imagine that they, that they will go and at the moment they don't seem to want to go at all. And they're still uh, staying on. But uh, the, the base is, has changed. The base, every, I mean, everyone I meet will, be, will speak very strongly against the Rajapaksas in particular. They're, they're focusing on them. Now, I mean, just to be a little bit fair, I think that the root, if you go, look at the root cause of this problem, the economic collapse, uh, it's that we basically we live beyond our means. We were borrowing all the time, we were borrowing. We were borrowing for consumption on the basis that we were like an upper middle income country. Uh, so everything, all the luxuries were very, very freely available here. Then, so consumption, we borrowed and then spent it on consumption, not, not on investment. Then secondly, where investments were concerned, we went in for a lot of these white elephant projects and most of those came from China. Even though our debt to China is not so huge. I, I heard it's about 10% the, in the payments, the repayments that we have to make to China, about 10% of the outstanding, the debt. But anyway, the, whatever we bought, generally what we borrowed from China ended up as a white elephant project, huge, the highest tower in South Asia or something, which is now empty, the Lotus Tower. Then the airport in Matala in the middle of a jungle, uh, you know, with, with hardly any planes coming, the port where we, there we were told that uh, there'd be, I don't know, 50,000 ships coming in um, every year and maybe 500 are coming every year. Uh, so we were totally misled by those white elephant projects. And of course the corruption. So we borrowed money, but it was not used for productive purposes. So that's the root cause. And it, that, that started a long time ago, before even before the Rajapaksa, it started. But I think under the Rajapaksa, it, it accelerated. Now, the proximate cause, the immediate cause for this crisis came after the election. Immediately after the election, the presidential elections in 2019, when the, when the government was now facing the general election, they won the, as soon as they won the presidential election, they declared a tax break and halved, I think halved the taxes and uh, especially for the rich people and the companies. And as a result, the, the tax uh, revenue dropped very drastically. That's all that's why. And then they, they the, the justification was that you, you reduce the taxes, people work harder and the businesses will invest more and the economy will boom. But then unfortunately COVID came. So the tax breaks came without the production, without the increase in capacity. Then came the most disastrous uh, decision of our president very stubbornly he decided that we would shift over to organic farming in a day, just one day, one day's notice. And we are now 100% going to organic farming and everything, all chemical fertilizers banned. So that, that was a, took about six months to reverse. And actually the start of today's protests were the farmers who came out in, in isolated areas, it didn't really resonate with the rest of the country because this was the farmers protesting, but, and the government was saying, don't know this uh, fertilizer thing, it'll work, uh, organic, it'll work, and we must go this direction. So most people were not, I mean, and too bothered. I mean, people were not living in the agricultural sector, that the farmers were. And then the third major uh, reason for this is that refusal to go to the IMF, refusal. Even three years ago, before this government came, under the previous government, we had a very good uh, 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 governor of the central bank. And he warned, even three years ago, he said, we are going to come to this pass where we will not be able to borrow enough. We have to go to the IMF. We have to adjust ourselves. It will be a little painful, but let's do it. Now, three, this was three years ago, before this government came, then this government came in and they refused to go to the IMF until disaster struck. So now we have our people, most people are blaming the Rajapaksas for this. And basically the summary of the argument is that the Rajapaksas have stolen the dollars. And that's the, that's the fury that people have, that the Rajapaksas, all the dollars in our country have been stolen by them. And they even shipped it out in uh, container loads to Uganda uh, there are stories like that. And people kind of believe this. So this is the background to this. And uh, 
uh, just to, I mean, I think I may be talking a bit too long now because it's the opening session, but India's generosity, I mean, that is remarkable. There's no, actually, no, very little criticism, no criticism of India now. No criticism. There was a little criticism of India at the beginning when uh, India also got us to sign, I think, five defense treaties, uh, which India had been trying to get us to sign beforehand. And now to get this aid, the first billion that we got from India, we had to sign these five. There was a bit of criticism. But I now don't see any, I don't know what Eastern said, because Eastern probably follows the, the media much more closely than I, but I don't see any criticism of India at the moment. Uh, and, uh, and there's also this, in a way, a very, you know, a very positive, a, a con sort of maybe too much blasé feeling that, oh, India will bail us out. India will bail us out even in the future. That hope is there, but I, 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 know, I know it must be very difficult for India. India is, India a lot of poor people itself who India must look after and that they should be giving it to Sri Lanka. And we are grateful. We are very grateful to it. And, and I'll stop with that at the, for, for the time being. Uh, okay. Uh, Jehan, would you like to respond to any of my questions? Uh, yes, what, what are the questions? Uh, the questions were about, I see, uh, one is um, the, 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 the Rani Ladmo has been talking about an, you know, a collaboration between Sri Lanka and Southern states of India. Okay. And then number two is whether this struggle, this uh, movement, this agitation, will take the shape of a political party, will acquire the shape of a political party in the future. Do you foresee any such uh, thing happening? Finally, is this an opportune moment to address uh, this uh, Tamil question? Yeah, I mean, uh, very, very briefly about the, on the first one, I, I, would always, I would always have been happy if uh, Sri Lanka had forged closer ties with the South of India. Now, I think this is a good, this is a real good chance to see we all, all countries come to a certain point where they have to reboot themselves. They have to go in a new path, a new direction, a new ethos. And up to now, up to now, Sri Lankans, as a Sinhali, the majority, have seen India as essentially a historical enemy, along with the Tamil people. Because in the Sinhalese history, is written how whenever the Sinhala kingdoms were flourishing, there were invasions from the south of India which destroyed those kingdoms. And, uh, and the Tamil people then ex expanded. Then more recently, the, what happened with the LTT, the Indian support at the beginning for the LTT. Now, I think we must make a break with, so when Ranil Vikramasinghe was talking, although it made rational sense, there was resistance within the Sinhala, I think the Sinhala society, the Sinhala polity, because the memory that, you know, India is, is something to be guarded against. India is, India has been a threat to us. India can be a threat in the future. Uh, so this thinking is there in us. It, it needs to go. It's there in our history. It's taught to our children from a young age. I went through that uh, history. So I know what it is. We have, there has to be a break. We have to reinterpret our history. This is a very good opportunity to do that because, as I said, there is no anti-Indian feeling now. And we are actually very grateful and think India is our lifeline. India is going to save us. So I think we need to, we have to be careful. I think, but this is an opportunity to 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 re redo our history, rethink our history. I hope we do it uh, because things really are changing in our country, and this is the best opportunity for that. With regard to the political party. Uh, at the moment, I don't see a new political party emerging, but I see some of the older parties gaining strength. Uh, the, the old left, say the JVP, which on two occasions engaged in violence against the Sri Lankan state and of thousands, tens of thousands died in 1971 and 1988-89. It's like, your, what I think what the Maoist type of insurrection that, that is there in different parts of India, is that type of vision, this JVP, uh, revolted and uh, but now they have become they are becoming more mainstream because they are the ones who are in the forefront they are the ones who are pointing out the government's corruption they are the ones who have files on the government leaders and they are exposing them 
and what is very new about the what's happening today in Gaul in in the protest is that we are now seeing the young people as as actually in the past we saw them as troublemakers as riffraff as the university students who are actually the core the core of the protest that's coming day and staying on in in Gaul face where the big protests are taking place in front of the presidential secretary the core of them come from the university system and those and and the core is also union unionized I and mean, there are student unions and those student unions are controlled by left part two two very radical left parties but now the el, older generation is seeing the the youth who are protesting as actually we are on the same side and there are some of us who actually think we should go there to protect the youth because the police are used to assaulting the young people and the, the university students because they are treated as troublemakers and riffraff but when the older people go, it's harder for the police to do that. So any, mm -hmm. what I see is a, a bonding. There's also a certain bonding in terms of ethnicity. For the first time, I hear these young people shouting slogans saying, no to racism, we will not get tricked again by racism, by the racism of politicians who make who try to get our votes. But at the same time, I, it, it requires, I mean, when it comes to issues of power sharing, devolution of power, federalism, then again, the old... Uh, divisions can re-emerge. Uh, so we have to be careful about that. But at the moment, I don't see a new political party coming up. I see the old parties, uh, the, the JVP, the left party, gaining in strength. I don't know how, whether it, at elections, it never really translates into votes. So this time it may be different. And, that, and that's what I think. Uh, and on I think that- ethnic, ethnic question, whether this is an opportune moment oh, yeah, to that, address this yeah, question. No, on or, that, on that, you know, there, there is a certain, uh, as I said, in the big protests, we hear we hear this slogan, no to racism, we will not be tricked again by politicians who may who turn us against one another. That think, thinking is there. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. what I have also noticed when I went to the North, in the North, the people are not so involved in these protests, yeah. the majority mm -hmm. of people. And when I ask the civil activists of why this is so, they give many reasons. They said one thing. They said, we did not vote the Rajapaksa. We never voted for the Rajapaksa. So there's no need for us to come and protest. We, never, we were never for them. It's the Sinhalese who have to show that they are against the Rajapaksa. That's one. Then secondly, they say, when we suffered, we also suffered. We suffered much more than this. But the Sinhalese didn't join us at that time. They didn't support us. So that bitterness is there. Then third, they say, even if the Rajapaksa are chased off, sent off, and the and new government comes, they also will ignore our problem. They also will, because that's been the practice over the years. So that that divide is there. And then on the Sinhala side, we can see even now, we can see government people are trying to, again, trying to divide. They are saying, the latest is to say, because the Catholic Church has been also in the forefront of the protest because of Easter bombing, the Catholic Church says, they trusted this government to investigate the Easter bombing. The Easter bombing happened under the previous government. They trusted this government leadership to investigate the Easter bombing. This government has not done it. And then the, now the church is saying, this government actually benefited from the Easter bombing. Therefore, the evidence seems to suggest that this government leadership was actually participant in the Easter bombing. And they are protesting fully. Now the propaganda is being spread that there is a, uh, I, I just, I saw on the social media that there is a world Catholic conspiracy to, you know, to spread Catholicism and to come to Sri Lanka. So they're trying to use the government side is using everything it can, the racism. Then the, the, I think at the beginning itself, the prime minister said something like this. He said, these young people must not insult the armed forces. The armed forces are the ones who supported and saved the country. The young people are not insulting the armed forces. In fact, the young people who are protesting are carrying the Sri Lankan flag and going everywhere. And they are, they are not at all insulting the soldiers. So, but I think that this, 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 is, a, this is a time where the ethnic issue can be addressed, but we have to be a little careful because yeah. where we are all united is on the economic issue, on the issue of corruption, but on the issue of ethnic justice, there needs to be education also done before we can really go into that. I mean, that's a summary. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Jahan, for your illuminating uh, uh, speech. Uh, now I would request Mr. Heblika to make his uh, marks. 
Mr. Hablika. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ramakrishna. Um, it's good to see you back on the screen and interact with okay. people like us. And um, good morning to all my Sri Lankan friends and to my Indian colleagues who are on this show. Uh, firstly, let me say that we had, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, as I look at it, Jahan has covered the mosaic very well. And I want to just say four points. That the, um, I heard the Sri Lankan finance minister's uh, interview with Nitin Gokhale a few days ago, where he was very blunt and very, very, very contrite that what is his view of the current situation, uh, why it has come to a sorry pass, and what is intended to be done and how the future is going to look like. And um, I think uh, Ali Sabri's uh, uh, articulation was very, very, uh, you know, illuminating to use that word, because I think uh, he did not, um, was not afraid to pull his punches. He, uh, he was able to shine the torch on those areas which people are not seen. And the very areas which Jahan has pointed out, and Ali Sabri was very, very forthright. As I see it, the next 12 to 18 months are going to be a very troubled period in Sri Lanka's economic history and uh, economic development. I think much more is required by them to make sacrifices, which uh, have been a part of their life for the last 30, 40 years. This time, I think much more is going to be expected from them. The issue at stake today is that none of the political parties have actually told us what is it, what is the panacea for the economic problem. Uh, most of them want either the prime minister to go or the president to go. There is no idea whether they would like to go back to and have a general election, which is not possible under the present circumstances. What is the way forward? And I would, you know, because since the political parties, not one single political party has, I think, to my knowledge, given me a roadmap as to how he is going to address this economic issue. And as far as I'm concerned, the uh, the redressal of the economic issues will be, has to be seen in four verticals. You have to look at uh, the constitution. What is it that the constitution needs to uh, do? Or has the constitution the ability to do something in its present format, or do we require the constitution to undergo a series of changes? What is going to be the 19th Amendment plus, which people are suggesting, where uh, the uh, power will get circulated among uh, those who are in office today? The second one is about the economic policies. If you look at what Ali Sabri has said, uh, I think he has laid the blame at the doorstep of those who are in office today and he has been very categorical. He says in a population of 22, 23 million, Sri Lanka has a civil service of 1.6 million. Where does the government get funds to pay their salaries and their pensions if Sri Lanka is not able to create that amount of revenue by itself? Now that brings me to the question that Sri Lanka has a huge armed force at its disposal, the police force. How does the government intend to create I know, uh, bring down the, the civil service and this civil servant uh, participation in government's economic policies. The, the third issue is political issues. Are the political parties in a position to create a better environment for the country's economic policies? Are they are in a position to make those sacrifices that people want? I think uh, the general refrain of people on the streets is not only for the president to go home, I think it is also an expression of no confidence in the politicians who are in office today. It may not be the ones, the 225 members of parliament. It could be even for those who are in the provincial councils or in the local bodies. I think there is a great deal of uh, uh, unhappiness. The, there is a great deal of no confidence, not only in the civil service, but in the political class. Uh, what had happened today on the watch of the uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa and the uh, Gota's uh, problems is a legacy issue. It has happened over the last 60, 70 years. 
And uh, as I said, after the 2009, uh, uh, when this insurgency ended, Sri Lanka did not take any, uh, any particular step to address a post-insurgency period. What were the economic, social, and other policies that the government would have put in? What was the money that would have been made available to meet uh, a post-economic, uh, post, uh, see a post-victory uh, arrangements? I didn't see any. For example, when India signed the peace accord with the Mizo National Front in uh, 1986, we had a post uh, ceasefire action plan, which worked efficiently and effectively. And today, I think Mizoram is one of the most peaceful states in India's Northeast. Sri Lanka did not have a plan. Even after the uh, accusations of uh, the kind that have been floating around, I think the, the Sri Lankan government took it upon itself to protect whom people accused of having been involved in those uh, situations. I think that ghost has not gone away and neither will it go. Last but not the least, um, the situation, as I say, how does the socio-cultural uh, environment be seen today? We heard Jahan say, we heard others talk about uh, what the people think about the aid and assistance given by India. What uh, what do people think about India's past participation in Sri Lankan uh, political activities? And what is it that is going to be the future? As far as I see, uh, so what Ranil Vikramasinghe told me in 2004 was that he would like everybody in India's neighborhood to think that India is an opportunity and that India is not a threat. He says, how can a country of 1.2 billion not become an opportunity for its neighboring countries. Now we have uh, the example of the, the trade between India and Bangladesh, which has gone up to unprecedented uh, lengths. So there is something that has always been very strong political and economic uh, relationship uh, with Nepal, with Bhutan, other countries too. We don't have that serious a problem as we seem to have in other places. The, uh, the, the fourth point which is necessary is to create the kind of trust which is necessary. And uh, I don't think that the government of Sri Lanka, the government of India are alone in this. I think there are many other stakeholders. But most important is that, um, like what was said earlier, can India, six southern states of India, uh, welcome Sri Lanka into their economic pole? I think it is not impossible. I think a few weeks ago, the Sri Lankan High Commissioner to India, Milinda Moravoda, said that his government is open to India's participation in eight sectors of Sri Lankan economy. And I think um, all those eight sectors are high rise sectors, are high value sectors. And I find no reason that why we don't begin to talk about it now. And last but not the least, as I look at it, uh, we also need to understand as to why uh, Sri Lanka has come to this pass? What are the various uh, opportunities available to it? And does the, the, the Sri Lankan political establishment continue to have a myopic view of its relationship with uh, countries? For example, when uh, President Gota gave an interview to Nitin Gokhale in 2019, immediately after his victory, uh, he named six countries with whom Sri Lanka would like to take forward its relationship. Um, of course, he mentioned India, he mentioned Singapore, he mentioned Australia, he mentioned South Korea, he mentioned Japan, and um, he mentioned one other country and China. And I think uh, none of the other countries, excepting India, and now Japan, to whom Sri Lanka has appealed for assistance, uh, have don't seem to uh, figure anywhere in the roadmap of the, this presidency. So you cannot you know, afford to create friends when you need them. Friends are certainly when the times of need, but you cannot pick and choose. I think a time has come that Sri Lanka, the political establishment, the civil service has to reboot itself. And I would like to know as to even after recovery in, in 16 to 18 months, what will the political establishment do? Will it be able to take forward the reforms to their logical conclusions? Will they be able to take forward the constitutional aspirations of their own people? 
how will they bridge the divide between the majoritarian Sinhala society and the minorities? And last but not the least, how will they create a better environment for socio-economic understanding of the problems of the country? I think uh, there are a lot of questions that the, the political class, the 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 uh, four uh, houses, the Sangha, need to answer because. I see last year only there were so much of protests against India's participation in the East Container uh, project. And the very people who were at the vanguard of that movement seem to have suddenly abandoned the government. And how does Sri Lanka calibrate its relationship with China? I think the honeymoon with China is more or less at an end. And we hope that, you know, it's, it's finally is finished. And I think the Sri Lankans can now live outside the shadow of the Chinese threat. So I think with those um, comments, uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, I will take a pause. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Blika, for your thought-provoking speech. I now request Mr. Muthalingam to join. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting for this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Jayan has explained the, the background of the economic crisis and also the current uh, prevailing situation in relation to the, the youth struggle. But I'd like to uh, pinpoint something. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Jayan also mentioned that the youths are now uh, uh, shouting that uh, um, no more racism or get it off from a, a human right for that uh, religious fundamentalism. And those are the slogans put forward by the um, youths in the Gotagama, that is the, where the youths are sitting in Colombo, as well as there are so many places in uh, Kandy and um, Gaul and the important city. They are uh, um, supporting groups who are there. But uh, among the slogans, there is a one slogan. Uh, I don't know the single uh, English word for that. I'm thinking that uh, one uh, slogan is Lanka wa India wa atakolwa. That is, Sri Lanka became a, uh, I think, uh, what is the uh, translation for atakolwa? Catchpole. I think it's catchpole. Catchpole. So that is yeah. the one of the uh, slogan put forward by the even myself. I also participated in the, uh, several days in, in Colombo as well as in Kandy. And that is the one slogan amidst the other slogan. So that indicates still, even though uh, the uh, uh, India in the critical juncture uh, assisted us to overcome by giving uh, loans and also for this uh, grant. What has happened was when soon as uh, Dr. Jain Sanka visited Sri Lanka, while giving uh, assurance uh, for the grant and the loan, he has signed uh, an agreement with the Sri Lankan government. Among the six agreement, the two most uh, thing is the security of the uh, maritime. And the second thing is the uh, getting the three um, what is that uh, hybrid power in of uh, Jaffna three islands and also the uh, fish, uh, developing a fishery harbors and the oil tanks. So this uh, agreement, these components push the uh, youths who are now currently shouting go home or go ta. They think that this is the uh, uh, situation where we are in a critical position to, uh, but India tried to grab us. So that is the thinking still prevailing because I used to talk with the Dantari, that is the oh, inter-university uh, school, uh, uh, university college of uh, uh, friends who are protesting. It's called Antari, Inter-University Federation. I had a dialogue with them also. They said India is good, but they are giving support. And, but in, it means uh, they are trying to fish in the troubled water. Now they are trying to conquer our country. That is the thing. Another <coughs> group of people, 
they had a dialogue with them also i told in some other uh, discussion also because there is a, a purely independent uh, liberal that is they are not aligned with the, any political party those are the groups who are working in uh, um, uh, uh, among the uh, the gotagama that group also having a yes the india are supporting but only thing is we still we have a doubt then the third group one of the powerful group another one is a peratogami there is a breakaway group of uh, jp political party they also in the part and parcel of this uh, uh, protest and they also uh, every day they also having a march they also have the same ideology so uh, what i think was it, when i uh, thinking about these uh, uh, the young generation who are now against the racism against the religious fundamentalism and also they need a kind of a uh government where everybody can enjoy the human rights and democracy but still they have a doubt on india then if you look at the i know that professor sudhir naran also wrote and quote several time our history because in 1940s when uh, uh, jr jayawardhan when he went to address the ramga conference in uh, in india he had the opportunity to meet his delegation to meet our Uh, the mahatma gandhi ji at that time they raised the issue of uh, the indians because at that time the anti racism against india is very in sri lanka is very high because of the 1930s recession so and they gandhi ji told them the, the 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 situation in sri lanka related to indians are uh, uh, pathetic and he uh, mentioned but at that time they are told him yes apart from um, uh, the indian laborers they are a petty traders and chettiyas they are the people who are exploiting us they are the people who are dominating import and export so that is the, then gandhi uh, ji they had replied yes that also true but it is a fault of both side the again 1947 another um, 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 leading uh, um, politician then establi bandhar naika he went to 1947 to india and when he addressed the uh, gatherings of the, um, uh, the indian national congress people that is called um, uh, uh, the south asian uh, uh, asian relation conference organized by mrs sarojin naidu at the time i want to read that also small part on that then he it was a, um, uh, um, t- um, broadcast in the indian radio also that is um, what our um, bandar naik said india must remember that it is the duty of a great and mighty to be just and even generous to the small and weak and to um remove from their minds not only the substance but even the shadow of the suspicion and the apprehension i think suspicion apprehension is the continuously from the sri lankan side is continuing because uh, they think that india will any time they will gulp us or they will engulf all the um, uh, sri lanka and that's why they also not supporting the part of the people who are support, uh, uh, not the the ethnic uh, question so here also i feel because when i had a, um, while this um, um, gota gama protest is going on there are so many dialogues and discussion take place among the civil society members so i am also one of part and parcel of the um, in the discussion uh, mostly the discussions are uh, organized by the single academics and the politician and the activists but uh, very rarely i see that uh, the, there are um, discussion taking place among the tamil academics or political uh, uh, political activists or the social activists but in the singular um, um, academia or the uh, intellect uh, intellect field uh, when i raised this issue because they also put forward even the bar association everyone put forward the uh, slogan or a demand that get it off from executive presidency and the form a new government with uh, consist of the all party and uh, they are not um, just mentioning anything about the the minority rights then when i question that uh, with the with the teams they said this is not a good time uh, to discuss on the ethnic issues because we want to get it off from this mind the rajapaksa regime there is the main so then i asked the question 
So do you think that what um, Mr. Ramakrishna also raised, is there any possibility to think about the uh, whether this will lead to uh, for a solution to the ethnic question? They said, no, 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 we will take it later. That is, but this is prevail not only uh, among the academics and the uh, and the social activists, but it is these are the mentalities prevailing even the uh, some opposition party leading members also. When I talk to them, so uh, I feel that uh, this um, struggle, which is um, initiated by the youngsters, it will continue. But only thing is, it won't lead any kind of a solution, seeking solution to the um, ethnic um, issues. Uh, in the in the near future, uh, it can be take place after the when the government uh, was changed. But only thing is, there is no any color you can see in. But at the same time, the anti Indian feelings. You, Dr. Jayan mentioned because yes, yesterday, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Prime Minister expressed his um, um, uh, his um, uh, congratulation or uh, to the um, yeah. Tamil Nadu government. But only thing is, if you see, none of the politicians, except Mr. Ganoganesh in the parliament, most of the people are not um, bracing or um, um, uh, highlighting the Indians' uh, contribution during the crisis period. So why is that? Because still, even the, because the, the part of the struggle was in the forefront are the JVP and the Paratagami. What is their ideology? Their ideology, the, India is a expanded because they have the ideology from the JV, right? it's a fifth, uh, fifth class is Indian expansion. Because now, even the media, if you look at the media, this is, uh, they also have that, the media of Sri Lanka. Media of Sri Lanka try to highlight whenever the Indian uh, negotiation for taking off these, uh, uh, the Arbor or uh, the, um, uh, what is that called, uh, uh, the hybrid, um, uh, um, Power and also the, they are highlighting in the media first the Indian um, 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 bilateral agreement. This it, second will be they will I know the China. China also taken the Sri Lankan uh, harbor and also they given the land for the build the island and all that. But the priority will be given or exposed or the priority will be given to the Indian agreement. So. This is coming from the um, 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 1930s onward. The young generation also become the victim of the, this ideology. They are obsessed with an idea because India is a bigger threat to us. So I didn't feel anything because they will like that, uh, you know, India is giving the support. But if you go for a next time, they will forget that. So my suggestion is to in order to using this crisis, in order to um, get it off from the, the ideology and the fear which is prevailing among the majority community, then we should have a kind of a, while bilateral uh, agreements are signed in between the government, we should promote the community, community relation. Because now the culture is one of the thing, everybody, even the, from the beginning, any politician come, we have a tie with the uh, India culturally and uh, historically and language and everything we'll mention. But there is no any kind of relations to build that. So culturally, because for example, if there is a possibility, India can assist us in this uh, critical junction, to send some youth from the Indian government, they can say there are so many volunteer groups in India. They can send some youth with some food pack. Then go with the work with the Sri Lankan community. Get um, then the Sri Lankan community get withdrawn from the uh, the fear psychosis. That is the main thing. And also there are so many uh, um, uh, Tamil Nadu government, any um, 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 uh, southern part of the government, they can also send with the, some uh, um, 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 pack. To go and meet with the one thing they can have a, the bilateral agreement with the government but at the same time they should build even the chambers because the now chambers also doing some kind of a charity why can't the, some, uh, the tamil nadu chambers or uh, other chambers of which are uh, in the state wise they can link with the local chambers mm. and uh, um, is there any possibility because the, now the media one media is the side. they are also promoting anti-indian ideology but is there any possibility link with the media people, the local media people of this, uh, India? They can come and they can also work with you. Through that only, I'm thinking we can build the relationship uh, where to get it off from the fear psychosis. Otherwise, I don't think that sending um, uh, goods or signing agreement or giving grant or loan in this juncture, they will people will prepare. 
but only thing is it won't be a last long. The last long should be a community community relation we have to build. And also there's a suggestion, what also um, a suggestion by even uh, uh, one of the um, economic role suggest we can build a relations with the southern part of India, that is um, uh, the, the develop uh, Tamil Nadu, Andhra and all that. That's also a good thing, but only thing is we should develop the culture where that culturally, uh, when we develop only, we can get it off from the peer psychosis. Unless we break the peer psychosis, we are not in a position because China, because still the people feel, even the politician, they are thinking China is far away. Even if they come, it won't be a bigger problem for us. But we are in the doorstep of the India. So India's step, uh, uh, stepping to Sri Lanka means it's a always threat to our sovereignty. That is the um, thinking. It's uh, trickled down to the, uh, the farmers, that is the bottom line, because the, you should not forget one thing every time. Keep it in mind because the SARS book also, even Professor Suryanara also mentioned on that, because the, uh, the religious factor, the Buddhist, the Buddhist religious factor is the most powerful factor. It can be created ideologically anti Indian um, um, mentality because when you enter into the because the, in Sri Lanka because every uh, Buddhist student should go to the uh, the full moon day to the temple in the temple they will quote the Mahavamsa from the Mahavamsa Damila is the, it's empty uh, from the Mahavamsa to up to the Indian peacekeeping force which landed near Sri Lanka every time Sri Lanka is facing the threat from uh, India. So therefore, the uh, religious factors also working very hard. So there is a, now, people, now the Indian government is giving opening all the Sanchi, all the airport and everything. But only thing is there is no any kind of a build between the religious leaders you should bring now to Tamil Nadu. You can show that where the Pondicherry within the Tamil Nadu is existing and the Karakal is another part of the Pondicherry. So that type of ideologically we should give environment uh, uh, to them where the federalism or uh, uh, the dividing, what is that, uh, devolving power is not leading to a, uh, the country to, to divide the um, um, country and uh, align with the Tamil Nadu. So I think in that way only we can take this opportunity and this is a, this is a, this is a starting point to get it off from the peer cycles with the majority. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Muthalingam, uh, for your well-meaning ideas. In fact, uh, your suggestion um, has kindled me the memories of uh, Gopalan Trophy, you know, which took place yeah. annually between uh, Ceylon team and uh, Tamil Nadu team or Madras team. Yeah. And it went on till uh, Sri Lanka got test status and then it got disrupted. Maybe. Yeah. That kind of event, that kind of tournament can be revived. This, uh, you, yeah. this, the people to people contacts that uh, uh, no, tired to approach uh, that, uh, that, that, that has to be revived. I now request uh, Professor Surya Narayan to make his speech. Professor Surya Narayan. Can't hear. Now can you tell me? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, please go ahead. Yes, sir, please go ahead. May I at the outset express my deep sense of appreciation to Mr. Sashi Nair and Ramakrishnan for taking the initiative to organize this panel discussion with members from, two, from both countries. I think this is the first instance that Chennai has such a meeting. I congratulate once again Sashi and Ramakrishnan for taking the initiative. At the end of the month, I have been invited to the India International Center in New Delhi to speak on this subject. 
and I'm also I have also persuaded the India International Center to organize a binational seminar affecting all aspects of India's human capacity. She telephoned me yesterday and they asked him how much time I can take. And he said 12 to 15 minutes. It's about 20 minutes of doctor to arm up in the classroom. Expecting to conclude the presentation in 10 to 15 minutes in an arduous task. Yes, it has to be as brief as possible. The holding factors, Elizabeth Taylor told her husband soon after a ninth marriage to complete this. Can you hear me? A lot of uh, interruptions. Anyway, I am not a specialist in Dishman science, as we call economics, but I will make some common sense comments. This is not the first time that I am making a battle with the In 1965, even I had been approaching the IMF. Of financial assistance. From 1965 to 2000, I had approached IMF 16 times to the economy. The most important question is that Ringa is approaching the IMF for a loan to repay the loan. After the drop so much time to stabilize the economy. Not only Sri Lanka, which is facing this problem, many developing countries like Pakistan, Argentina, Brazil, Greece, and Spain have been more or less in the same position as Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, is a 17 approach to IMO. The country is on the brink of economic collapse. It was a loan to repay a earlier loan. It was an external debt to take too much real dollars. It was a of the country's national wealth. One of the important reasons for the total uprising is the fall in agricultural production and the rise in the price of commodities. It is necessary to recall the fact that in the time of independence, Sri Lanka was a food deficit economy. A lot of food gains is imported from elsewhere. In fact, it goes to the credit of D.S. Tenanayaka, who was the first leader of the country. And he started the immediate of the irrigation project. As a result of the two years ago, Sri Lanka used to produce most of its food requirements, as a rice requirement, not food requirement. And one part of the result of it was a democracy change to place in the system problem. And finally, farmers are entering to migrate there. So we have a situation where finally, farmers are used to are more or less the technical In the point of view of, of Tamil Nadu, one of the things that there is the, the flow of refugees to India. We want to help them all those who want to come to India because of the cost of living, the fear of insecurity and all. But there is a new report in Colombo, Telegraph, which is an article written by. That is the rule that the Sri Lankan Navy is trying to prevent the Tamil from coming to Tamil Nadu. They detail that they produce them because the source of time is involved, then they are let go. The Sri Lankan Navy thinks that it can create the Berlin Wall in the past day, it cannot fail. Amazon can it fail? 
Ramakrishna, you're on mute and oh, Professor okay. also. Yeah. Professor, are you able to continue or uh, I think he has muted himself. Yeah, I think the audio is also not very clear, Ramakrishna. So okay. just sound him out and then we can move on. Right, right. right, right audio right. is not very clear. Yes, yes. I will, I don't know how to inform him. No, I think he can hear you if you just tell him. Uh, he will be able to hear you. I think he'll stop now. Just ask him to unmute. Okay. Uh, please unmute, uh, Professor. Professor. Please un unmute. Ah, uh, please uh, go ahead. Please. Uh, please wrap it up your uh, speech as early as possible. Hello? Ah. Yes, sir. Uh, please go ahead. Nobody has a question. Hello. Professor, we can't hear you. You have muted yourself again, Professor. We can't hear you. And your audio is also not clear. Yes. Uh, it's please, now unmuted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, please make your uh, concluding remarks. Right? Okay. Anyway, uh, we will uh, we, uh, please uh, thank you. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Eastman. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ramakrishnan. Thank you for having me on this uh, panel. Um, so I think. Uh, we are seeing a situation uh, in Sri Lanka now where uh, frustration has been building up to the extent that people are now, you know, taking to the streets and protesting. But uh, what started off as a protest against the president had uh, moved on to uh, people calling on Mahindra Rajapaksha to also step down. And now we're seeing uh, people also uh, calling for all 225 members of parliament to move out. I mean, that is probably not a realistic uh, a demand because, uh, you know, you need someone in there to run the country in the interim till we go for an election. Uh, and uh, election uh, is not uh, an answer at this moment, considering the situation that we are facing. Um, just on uh, India's role here, I think uh, India's role is being appreciated by a lot of people, both on the streets, uh, uh, our politicians and others as well. But there is still uh, this sense of, uh, um, what's the word, um, suspicion if there is something uh, beyond, uh, you know, just uh, friendly neighborhood uh, assistance here, or if there is something uh, more that India is expecting later on. Uh, because we saw this with China as well, you know, there's a lot of things, there was a lot being said as soon as China stepped in, uh, a lot of uh, assistance was brought in. Uh, I mean, you all know how close the Rajapakshas are and were with the Chinese. I, I say are because I still feel that, you know, uh, a few of them, uh, at least the prime minister, uh, is very close with the Rajapaksha, with, very close with China. Uh, you know, Namal Rajapaksha also has a very close association with the Chinese. And we've seen them uh, using uh, the local media, uh, at least certain sections of the local media, uh, to sort of promote uh, that, uh, you know, quote unquote, friend relations between Sri Lanka and China to ensure that there is no growing anger towards the Chinese, especially now that some people are blaming China for uh, this current crisis. Although Jehan uh, uh, said earlier that, you know, our debt ratio is not more high, not uh, too high as far as China's uh, loans are concerned. But still, uh, you know, a lot of people feel that all these white elephant projects uh, that Jehan spoke about uh, is the cause for uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the crisis that we're facing right now. 
Uh, and uh, there is this attempt uh, from what I have seen, from what I've gathered by speaking to uh, some journalists uh, and others, an attempt to make sure that we do not, that Sri Lanka does not lose uh, its uh, uh, relationship with China, that it maintains a relationship with China, and that it continues to uh, accept whatever Chinese uh, authorities offer Sri Lanka, although there may be strings attached. Uh, but having said that, a lot of people are, of course, also mindful that, uh, you know, India has stepped in at this moment, that they are the ones who are actually bringing in uh, most of the assistance, the assistance that Sri Lanka requires. Uh, and that is being uh, noted by uh, protesters as well. The other concern, though, again, is that uh, now with uh, a lot of growing anger towards uh, the Rajapaksha administration, uh, and with, uh, as Jehan said, uh, the leftist groups gaining popularity, uh, especially uh, the, the National Progress, the uh, People's Power or the JVP, with them ga gaining a lot of popularity and with all these uh, student unions also affiliated mostly with uh, the JVP, their policy has always been anti-India. And uh, even Yesterday, I was on the street uh, near Parliament where these uh, students were protesting and they were, of course, tear gassed at that point. But uh, some of the slogans that they were carrying at that point was also that, you know, that there is a hidden agenda as far as India is concerned. So changing that mindset is going to be uh, important for um, India, for one. And I think uh, whoever, you know, uh, is involved in the Sri Lankan issue uh, because uh, uh, the young people are being fed this uh, 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 this information that India is also here with a hidden agenda, China is here with a hidden agenda, Western countries are also stepping in with uh, various other agendas, so be mindful of taking assistance from them. So then who do we go to? Uh, you know, there is no one coming up with uh, an alternative solution, but they're just saying, don't go to these countries because these countries may have vested interests. Uh, so it's important that, you know, those, that mindset is, uh, it's changed uh, and that the younger generation are not made to think that, you know, there are hidden agendas. I mean, of course, certain countries may have uh, hidden agendas and the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, when they feel that have some uh, agenda, uh, but to think that everybody coming in is coming in with uh, an alternative motive, even though there may be some, uh, some uh, motive there, uh, you know, would sort of, uh, affect our progress, affect our ability to sort of resolve this crisis, uh, because this crisis is going to take much longer than people uh, think that it will get resolved. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, now saying, you know, if we take out all 225, then the issue will be resolved. But then what's the solution? And Rama, you were, you were asking about, you know, if people are now maybe thinking of uh, a new political force. In fact, when I uh, go to the streets, uh, when I spoke to people on the street yesterday, and when I spoke uh, to people on golf face, that is being mentioned. A lot of people are actually saying, you know, maybe now it's time that somebody else came in, a new political force takes over, that we have a complete change of uh, heads as opposed to a complete change of system. Now, the, the realistic change that we need is a change of system. Uh, but, you know, people are saying that maybe new faces would change everything. But the risk is that, you know, that was the same thinking that brought in Gotabe Rajapaksha. Although he was a known face, they felt that, okay, he, is not, he was not involved directly in politics. Uh, maybe he will come in with a few businessmen and change uh, the entire thing. And what he did was not change. He did something really worse. I mean, uh, he, you know, the fertilizer ban was a huge, huge mess. Uh, and uh, that has also cost Mahinda uh, his vote base, because I, I traveled to Hamban Tota, which was uh, his stronghold, and people who virtually worshipped Mahinda Rajapaksha are now saying that he's a traitor, that he has brought in Gotabe Rajapaksha and cost them uh, their livelihoods and cost the country. Uh, and when you ask these people, you know, uh, so you all voted for him and he seems to have done a lot for this area, they were like, yes, that is the past. Now it's different. Uh, so now we don't want to go to, we definitely don't want Gotabe Rajapaksha. We now don't want Mahinda Rajapaksha. We don't want Namal Rajapaksha. We want somebody else who would give us a solution and who would actually work on the issues that we face. So <clears throat> this whole 
thinking of mindsets uh, are also changing now. People are wanting change, uh, but some people are not too sure, you know, who would bring uh, the real change that they expect. Uh, we see, uh, you know, a little agitation growing in certain areas against uh, Sajid Premadasa, the opposition leader. Uh, you know, the way they are behaving in parliament, parliament is also being criticized. The fact that they are arguing and debating uh, issues that are not current sometimes, uh, even today, just before this webinar, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, back and forth going on in parliament about uh, Rani Vikram Singh and certain other allegations about uh, Sadiq Premadasa's mother, uh, you know, some comments that have been made about his mother instead of discussing the co-issue. So people are getting frustrated with the entire parliamentary, uh, uh, with, with the MPs, uh, you know, uh, and these protesters, these youth have now gathered outside parliament. Uh, they pulled down some barricades uh, last night. Uh, they've uh, stationed themselves there and they are like, you know, trying to move forward towards parliament. And these young boys, uh, uh, you never know what they would do. I mean, yesterday I witnessed how they were using all sorts of ways to bring down <coughs> the um, the barricades and coughing here because I was actually I got caught to uh, the tear gas as well and I'm still trying to recover from that and you know these boys they were getting hit by tear gas but they kept going forward so that sort of thinking uh, you know could be disastrous for Sri Lanka later on as well because if these boys try to take things into their own hands uh, that is something you would want to see um, as far as uh, you know, the ethnic issue is concerned, and if, if this may help build the bridges between the Tamils uh, and the Sinhalese, yes, we see a lot of people on the street are also talking about that as well. <coughs> we see even yet even yesterday where these uh, uh, where the student unions came and were protesting, we saw boys from Jackna also joining the protest, and that was uh, unique because. Uh, when you look on social media, some Tamil journalists from the North are tweeting and they are saying that, you know, this is not our problem, this is your problem. Uh, this is because, you know, I mean, like, like uh, Jehan mentioned earlier, you know, this 30-year this war when there were issues in the North, when Tamils were being hit, when Tamils were suffering, very little was said uh, in the South uh, and you know, no one really took to the streets and protested and demanded accountability, justice and so on. So now people are talking about the issues uh, uh, that the Tamils were facing, uh, you know, in some of the protests. We've seen uh, <coughs> uh, posters and images of Tamil journalists uh, who were killed in the North being carried in Colombo, which is, again, which is quite rare. I mean, one person, Isaipriya, she was uh, working for uh, the LTT run uh, uh, television station. So the military and the government at the time, you know, never recognized her as a journalist. They called her as an LTDE, uh, LTD member. But uh, in Goldface, we saw her image being taken around by Sinhalese journalists, Sinhalese, uh, you know, the ordinary public as well, calling for accountability and justice over her killing. Um, so we are seeing a change in mindsets there as well. Uh, but, you know, whether that will last, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, of course, a bit doubtful uh because uh, you know this could also be a case where everybody is just teaming up joining up to get rid of the rajapakshas once that happens once things settle down i wonder whether we will go back to the old style of thinking um because there are a lot of monks involved with these uh, you know unions uh, with these student unions as well and their thinking has always been different uh so uh, you know changing that mindset also might be difficult uh, but some of the youth, of course, uh, when I speak to them, uh, youth who are also affiliated with uh, the JVP, they feel that this is going to be a turning point. Uh, and if the Rajapakshas step down, that then, you know, this would uh, leave room for uh, better unity to come in, you know, for all communities to work together and for a proper change uh, in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. But that uh, is, is, you know, in the distant past as of now, uh, because right now the immediate uh, uh, issue is uh, uh, the economic issue and how that is going to be settled. Uh, and of course, just like one of the speakers said, there is no roadmap. Nobody's putting forward any plan or roadmap, be it the government or be it the opposition, as to how they're going to address this issue. 
even Sajid Premadas at times he says, you know, he's also uh, questioning uh, India's involvement here. Now, with what basis, on what basis he's saying that, no one knows. Because he doesn't say why he's questioning India's involvement. But it seems to be that he's just trying to find some, some sort of support uh, by saying that, uh, assuming that, you know, maybe there are people who support his views and then he can, you know, use that later on at an election. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, India's involvement is being uh, appreciated by most people. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that is something that is going to go a long way after this crisis. If India steps in further, <coughs> if India does more and if India, uh, you know, assists in the more critical areas, I'm sure that is uh, going to uh, help uh, our relationship as well. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Iswaran, for your uh, insightful first-hand account. Arun, can you take over? Hello. Hello. Ah. So, yeah, so all, almost, uh, I mean, people who spoke here are mostly veterans, and there are veterans like Murari Sar, uh, they're all listening this. Uh, we, we spoke about uh, this protest and the mistrust uh, about all that. So, like our uh, journalist friend, Mr. Isharan, and uh, Ramakrishnan sir mentioned in the first part, uh, this particular ongoing protest, uh, uh, you know, as, as he said, rightly said, you know, it, it has similarities to delicate protest or whatever happened in Delhi. Uh, so it, there are reasons, clear reasons, like, you know, the Sajid Premadasa being uh, non-committal, he warned uh, resignations, but he doesn't want to take part in the interim government. Uh, and the, the, the protest, the movement has no leadership, no ideology. So that means, you know, it is, it is not going by the conventional uh, pattern. So the conventional pattern is like, you know, there is an ideology, there is a leader and they they capture the government so none of these things are going to happen for for many internal and and for the nature of this protest but uh, what what i i feel that you know not all all such movements uh, you know not necessarily all these movements are to win in a in a conventional way because uh, for for the kind of democratic groups in sri lanka uh, maybe uh, this is a sign that you know they can they can be happy for the fact that uh, this is an organic movement, uh, uh, and and the and the response may be uh, at a lot of pent up anger uh, that was there in the country for long, because uh, I, I I was talking to people uh, in Sri Lanka. I, I didn't visit Sri Lanka in the last three four months, but while I was talking to people in the initial stage, the interesting trend was that. People were blaming almost all regimes in the past, almost all leaders in the past, from Sirisena to Ranil to Mahinda to Gota. Uh, and now, in the maybe maybe by March, you know things have changed. People started talking about only only about the president, only about the Rajapaksa family. So that means you know the anger was uh, reaching a saturation point, a, a a kind of a peak where people have narrowed down something else that actually standing before them. Uh, so, uh, hello. You go. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, uh, so I, I, I don't, I don't think, you know, these, these protests really have to win uh, or, or the, the purpose of protests is, you know, necessarily to, to outthrow uh, a, a government. So when we when we come back to the main discussion point that was about the mistrust uh, of people, uh, the, the 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 mistrust towards India in the in the mind of people in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, maybe yeah, for for good souls, people with you know uh, people with goodwill, uh, we can we can look at it in such a way that you know if you know it would have been really nice if. The people of Sri Lanka had a trust towards India, or 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 the other way, uh, like the the Sri Lankan Tamils had uh, uh, trust towards the Sinhali government. Uh, but but the fact is that uh, I mean it, it may not be very very difficult to understand the fact that you know uh, 
the Sri, Sri Lankan mistress towards India is uh, as powerful as you know the Tamil mistress towards the Sinhalese because it is just like how the majority Sinhala Buddhist regime uh, ruling uh, the people of minorities in Sri Lanka. The India also uh, being a big brother, you know, being that powerful uh, neighbor of a very very small country. So that presence itself will will make any country uh, insecure. Uh, I I I have spoke to many. Uh, I mean, I have friends who tell me that you know, Sri Lankans do not trust India because of LTT. Uh, because you know India, India groomed uh, and and weaponized a armed rebel group, and they they diverted the path of you know Sri Lanka for the next three decades. Last three decades from early eighties at least have changed a lot. Even before that, Sri Lanka had a lot of problems, including JVP. But we can see that the mistrust towards India is not only LTT because even before that, in in in. Uh, 71 war uh, Sri Lanka was with Pakistan uh, in even in in 60s there were local assertions to retrieve uh, plantation lands uh, and the Indian origin Tamils uh, from the from the uh, you know who are who are brought in by British and as we discussed in detail about the JVP role in it how JVP theorized this this Indian expansionist role uh, even even during the recent uh, programs, you know, uh, uh, I, I was I, I can I can significantly see this, uh, you know, how JVP theorized these uh, problems of uh, India as a big neighbor. Uh, let it be the the Tringo, the recent Tringo oil farm tank, or the Sevi Samudram issue, uh, or the or Adani coming to Sri Lanka. So JVP was compiling all these, even in even the during in the in the recent years, uh, the, the kind of campaigns in Sri Lanka. But despite all that, uh, we can see that, you know, India has done a lot. Uh, uh, India is doing big in helping Sri Lanka, uh, especially after this crisis started. Uh, and India has an advantageous position uh, because uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, response of Sri Lanka to the crisis. China may, might have expected that you know they will be approaching China for for whatever restructuring. But Sri Lanka, we saw that you know they they immediately they turned to Bangladesh and India, and Bangladesh helped immediately, and India is still helping them. So uh, 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 India is helping Sri Lanka in a big way, uh, and. And for ordinary people who are who are struggling for fuel and you know paracetamol and medicines and all these things, essential even candle lights, uh, maybe India is playing a big role. So so that way, whatever mistrust happened in the past, maybe uh, you know finding a, a, a repair stage. There may be a a kind of goodwill that India is playing a big role right now. But at the same time. Uh, for ordinary people, it is helping, but geopolitically, it is a, a big country helping a smaller country is also seen as uh, buying over. Uh, so uh, it may be kind of you know a, a very complex relationship uh, uh, that existed in the past, and uh, maybe maybe that is what going to continue also. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, uh, this may be one one crucial juncture when. Where, where India really have, uh, you know, take a leverage. India really has a lot to do in terms of, uh, uh, you know, at least to ensure that there are no major inconvenience uh, from Sri Lanka, a country which is, which is actually surrendered a lot before China in terms of their, their financial obligations. Uh Thanks a lot, uh, Arun, uh, for your uh, observations. Uh, I find a number of uh, friends of the audience. Uh, Mr. Murari, you have anything to say? Okay. All right. And then, Mr. Murari, okay, and then, right. Uh, 
there is one uh, gentleman. Okay, uh, Satyamothi is also not there. Okay, right. right. I think Mayama is there. Mayama is. Yeah. How oh, can you hear me? Ah, right. Ah, please. No, so oh, we have. Uh, I, I say heard the presentation of so many people. Okay. Uh, quite a few people. Uh, the general impression is, I feel it's a. Uh, this is a, Sri Lanka has walked into it. It's a kind of nemesis. Because mm -hmm. I was there uh, when the China entered in a big way as a, to counterbalance Indian influence. Yeah, one man said J JVP, even others said they view India with suspicion. That has been there all the time. The last important event was 2008, SARC summit event. At that time also, even before that, Nirupama Rao, when she was the High Commissioner, had a chance to talk to her. In 2005, when China entered in a big way, Hamantota was uh, to be leased out. India was the first they approached. India found it, knew it was unviable, and they showed no interest in that project. And at the same time, India also told Sri Lanka, don't get into the uh, China's uh, debt trap. They will come in a big way. This is new way of expansionism. They give financial assistance at low interest, and then they will capture. You know what happened? They, then they went into uh, Haman Tata, now the Colombo project, and, uh, and long lease and all that. A lot of money must have changed hands. I don't know about that. But this is something they, they knew they were heading for, but there's there nothing they could do about it. More than anything else, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Uh, most most important, have you heard of a foreign a man who is not in a citizen taking over as president of that country, Gotabaya? He was all rewarded because the man who led that war against Sri Lanka, I mean, the Tamils. Okay. So how can there be reconciliation? And what happened five years ago? Sri Lankans, the Tamils are totally out of the picture, they're sidelined and out of the power equation. Maybe a handful of people are in parliament. Besides that, what happened in parliament? Siripala had a problem with getting on with Mahindra Rajapaksa. So there was a power crisis. Then, then uh, Rajapaksa took uh, Gotabaya took over and full control as president and prime minister. One family is controlling the entire uh, nation. Uh, they say well, there should be accountability. Okay, they will resign and quit because nobody can uh, take this situation, handle the situation. That can be a national government. But should there not be accountability? They got away with the war crimes. At least now they have landed the country in an economic mess. Should there not be any accountability? Should not be uh, whoever comes there. But the problem is who is going to uh, succeed them? There is a power vacuum. There is leaderless, rudderless, no government, chaotic okay. situation. India is doing the right thing. Even Tamil Nadu has said they will come forward to help the people to people. Yes, they should do that. Beyond that, unless there is accountability, even the Sinhalese have to think in terms of accountability. Who okay. comes there? Thank you, the thank you, Murari. Ah, okay. It will happen again and again and again. Right. That's my short take on it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Heblika, uh, how do I, how do you respond to this uh, views on anti-Indian, no, uh, sentiment? Of course, there is a tradition, all that they are talking about the long history. So, what should the, what should the India do to address this problem? Can India do anything uh, to get this? Oh, uh, see, this is a very, very interesting question it's a very very interesting situation um when i was at the icwa three years ago the same question came up for discussion whether india and sri lanka should step away from the developments of the 1980s the consensus was that yes a beginning should be made because the generation that is now in Colombo or in Sri Lanka, would want to take a break from the past. What happened uh, in the period? Whom do you blame and why do you blame is something that history will answer. But at this point of time, I think there is a need to take a break from the situation that exists. There is a need to create a ambience where um, uh, steps could be taken to mitigate these kind of threats. I think what is to be understood is the situation in the north of Sri Lanka is understood more by people in the south of India and the people in the south of Sri Lanka do not seem to understand what the problems are in the south of India. I think how do you bridge this gap? Who are the people who are likely to create a 
a bridge to overcome this. I don't think mm. to use the word suspicions about India, to use the word that there's a fear about India, I think uh, it is um, misogyny, it is uh, improperly used. Just one instance I give you in when we had the tsunami in 2004, which country was the first to respond? It was India within 18 hours. Uh, mm. India had the six Dornier aircraft flying into Sri Lanka with uh, eight. The Western powers or the other countries came much later. Every time Sri Lanka has an emergency, you respond, uh, the help comes from India. I think that needs to be flagged to the minds of the people. The second one is, I think this uh, particular uh, economic pandemic has now shown that the Sri Lankan polity needs to step away from some of the uh, from some of their own ideas that has imprisoned them you have to reboot yourself unless you think big unless you think that you are uh, moving in the right direction you cannot address yourself somebody did mention about the important role the sangha plays in sri lanka yes the role that sangha plays is so respectful and so revered that uh, like what the prime minister did when he went visited Sri Lanka two years ago. Yes, there is a need to reach out, to talk to them. I think all these things are, uh, are actions in progress, steps in progress, and we need to have patience. Because as far as India is concerned, we don't seem to be wanting to look at Sri Lanka as another outpost of the Chinese. As I said earlier, the, this economic breakdown has shown that Sri Lanka needs to be very careful as to how it deals with China. India has had the experience right from 1947 dealing with our northern neighbor. We understand them much more, but we are even stronger to withstand Chinese pressure. I think the Sri Lankans have to build different synergies. The first and foremost is to create a sense of trust that India is not a threat, that India is an opportunity, and that everybody else, parliamentarians, provincial parliamentarians, local councillors, media, opinion makers, they need to uh, see how uh, things are going to happen. One last thing, if any election takes place now in the next two years, uh, the battle will be lost in the kitchen. It's not going to be in the living room because the housewife is going to tell the, the future uh, legislators that where they went wrong. Rani lost in 2004 in April because the housewife Fell let down. How many of those 6.1 million people who voted this uh, dispensation into power are likely to you know, remain loyal to them? So that's what my prediction is. Unless there is an earnest effort to reboot yourself and to create, take this uh, particular thing as an opportunity to improve yourself, it's an inflection point. People on the street, in the government offices, and in the political framework, they have to think where they went wrong and how do they address this problem. And what Arun said, or uh, Mr. Uh, Ratnam said, accountability is very important. You have to prepare for a vacuum without the without the Raj boxes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heblika. Uh, Dr. Jahan, would you like to respond? <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this has been a very interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what I would, I mean, the three points I would like to bring up is this, that I think in a way China has been edged out at this time. And we saw China's unhappiness when it even objected, initially it objected to Sri Lanka going to the IMF. It made certain unhappy comments about it. But it then changed. It changed because it realized that it was out of sync with what everyone else was saying, including what the Sri Lankans themselves are saying. I think India is better positioned than China, much better positioned because of also India's relationship with the Quad countries. So I think the government is now, because that there's also from the US and the Western countries, uh, the government has felt more comfortable, uh, I think, going with India rather than with China. I, this is something that has been quite striking that we expected China to give more support than it has been willing to give. And uh, it has been a bit disappointing, I think, to the government that China has tried and not been happy with what India, I mean, with what's happening. 
and it has been in in this current situation definitely india has taken the center stage in in the efforts to support sri lanka and stave off this crisis to us and uh, the other thought i had is with regard to relationship building i think the sangha the monks are very important they are actually very important because they are the custodians of our traditions and our memories and in our history it is said that uh, that uh, that uh, the ones who I and mean, the people who wrote we believe the historians who wrote our history were actually buddhist monks who wanted to preserve buddhism on this island and they wrote with that vision and they gave the singhal is a vision that they must protect buddhism on this island and it's in that context that the tamils and the and india have become kind of like uh, enemies however there is one great advantage that india has which is that it is the it has the birthplace and the sacred sites of uh, buddha gaya of, of of buddhism now in in the normal singhalis uh, vocabulary we don't refer to when we go to the buddhist sites in india we don't say we are going to india we are going to dambadeva not to india <laughs> dambadeva that is another language that is being used but i think i think there's a lot of scope because even in the work that i do as a in my ngo these exchange visits are very powerful where we take people from one community to the to the areas where the other community lives and and they have to, they have to see for themselves i think i mean it might be a good investment for india to for the government to invest a little bit in the buddhist monks in exchange visits and because they would love to go they want to go to to the buddhist sites but may you can route them through chennai through tamil nadu where they will see that i mean it's so similar to sri lanka i mean, i i i used to i used to come to india when i was young as a as a tennis player i mean i used to play tennis at and and i remember at a very young age i came to india when i was 13 and i felt so even though i didn't know tamil language i felt so comfortable in india to travel in the three wheels to argue with the three wheel drivers when they tried to overcharge there was no fear because it's so much like sri lanka and i think that opportunity should be pre- presented to our buddhist monks who otherwise are very insular they don't get a chance to travel and they are in fact they they are they feel marginalized by the western countries also so because they don't get that chance to speak in english and to travel to other countries so i think that's something that you need to think about uh, and to to help to to build the relationships thank you thank you uh, jahan uh, there is one question from what is her name thana thana shagrithiya i think he, she has just started working with uh, professor surya narayan in looking at helping with uh, sri lankan refugees in tamil nadu uh, she has raised this question what's what is india's true interest in this matter if the aim is to solve or help its neighbor in this economic crisis should not india be focusing on solving its internal crisis first isn't uh, isn't the fundamental root, root of all this is crisis between tamils and buddhists if that issue gets resolved why the, why would there be any need for neighboring countries to get involved and then she goes on to say say that um, sri lanka is very rich in uh, talents and natural resources and it does not have any what she calls any over population issue it can be so effective if the internal crisis is solved so india is in a good place to solve that so that's the the question from uh i mean if i may quick, if i may quickly give a brief answer but i mean i my my okay. other other two sri lankans will also want to say something okay if i may very briefly say it i think i mean india by coming in india has actually has helped to bring in the, i mean has been has been able to bring limit china's role i mean now china was actually there was a time when china was on in the news all the time 
And sometimes very arrogantly, the Chinese ambassador was making various statements. He was commenting on everything. But now they have become very quiet. And I think they have got pushed. I mean, India has come more into the center stage. China has. So, and, and I think China, China's presence in Sri Lanka is indeed a matter of great concern to India. Geo, in looking at it in geopolitical terms. So I think that that purpose has been served to some extent. Now we don't know for how long this uh, will continue, where Sri Lanka will be grateful to India and, uh, and, and China will be kept away or China's expansion will be limited. I, I think that has to also be thought about because Sri Lanka is indeed a security threat to India if, if the Chinese come in too much. Um, but as for the dealing with the, the, the Singhala Tamil problem, that's a problem that goes back in time. It even goes back to our independence, even before our independence. The leaders of these communities were struggling for power. Uh, and, uh, you know, power sharing, the issue of power sharing, uh, that definitely has to be solved. I mean, it, we need to solve that problem, but... Uh, India can give support. Again, India should support. It. India should remind us about it. And there is a need for extra, and the Tamil people in particular, because they are a minority in Sri Lanka, they have to look to the internationals. They look to India, they look to the Western countries, to give them the strength that they don't have within the country numerically, within the democratic system, they don't have strength because they're a minority, even though they are a regional majority and they think like a regional and they think also like a majority. The Tamil people are very proud that but they don't, they can't defend themselves within the parliament. So in uh, India's constant reminder to Sri Lanka, India always reminds Sri Lanka that the, that the Tamil problem needs a just solution. The Western countries also are putting pressure. But I think uh, in, in the end, we, I mean, the Sri Lankans have to also deal with it themselves. And that's what organizations like ours are doing. We are always trying to bring this issue up and, and find an am amicable set a settlement. And, in fact, this crisis has given us the chance to say that it is that we lost a lot of opportunities during the period of the war to develop our country. Right. Our military spending is very high, extremely high. Uh, and I think it, it is something that should be reduced uh, in, in the coming, in, when dealing with this crisis. Uh, yeah, so those are some of the thoughts that I would want to share. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, Ishwaran, uh, I have one question that is, uh, there is a perception that the entire agitation that is going on in Colombo uh, is being dominated by the elite of Colombo, number one. And there is a, what should I say, support from some corporate group and all that. It's all backing. So it is, uh, to, uh, so the, 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 what they say is that, that the, what, what the, the insinuation uh, that I could, uh, what about the message that I can get is that uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the, those who are on the uh, Gal face, uh, they don't represent the, the, the genuine population of Sri Lanka. They are the cream of Colombo, but they have some problems. So that's why they have come out and all that. Well, although the, the focus is on the protests uh, in Colombo, uh, you know, protests are taking place right around the country. It's just that, you know, there's a lot of uh, media attention now on the protest that's taking place in Golfis because of, uh, you know, these uh, hashtag slogans that have been given to uh, these protests. I mean, uh, Go Gota Village or Go Gota Gama, uh, has, you know, Golfis has been named uh, as Go Gota Gama or Go Gota Village. Uh, and, you know, uh, the protest that's uh, taking place near the Prime Minister's uh, <coughs> house has been given a different name. Uh, now the protest in Parliament or near Parliament has been given a different name. But then these protests are, of course, taking place uh, outside Colombo as well, in Gaul, in Mathura, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, in Kandy. Um, so it's not really uh, something that is uh, an issue that is being, uh, you know, brought on by the... Colombo elite. Uh, of course, you know, uh, this issue is also being raised or this, this uh, you know, Colombo involvement is being raised because there's a lot of, uh, you know, assistance coming in for the protesters who have gathered at Gaul Face uh, and uh, near Parliament. Uh, we see 
you know, lots of vehicles driving in, people bringing in water, food, uh, all sort of medication. Uh, although Red Cross has also established itself uh, uh, at Golf Face, uh, you know, a lot of people are bringing in all sorts of assistance. So people are questioning, you know, where is all this coming from? Uh, you know, uh, are these, you know, people, businessmen funding uh, uh, these protests? Uh, and, you know, that is that has led to, you know, this, this uh, impression uh, that, you know, uh, this is... Uh, just an issue for people in Colombo, and as a result, you know they are funding the entire protest just to keep it alive. Uh, but in my uh, opinion, uh, and based on what I have gathered by going on to the streets uh, out of Colombo, uh, you know it's not just a Colombo uh, Colombo focused issue. It's an issue that a lot of people outside Colombo, I probably more you know people outside Colombo feeling the heat more than the people in Colombo because people in Colombo can, you know, to a certain extent, they can manage. Uh, but people outside, like the farmers, you know, uh, they are struggling big time. Uh, so they, uh, you know, they can't sustain the protests, of course. Uh, again, like in Gaul, they're not getting the same sort of assistance and funding. So, you know, they were saying that, you know, they need more money to sustain the protests. So they've given up in certain places uh, because the same support is not there for them. Uh, but the issues remain. Thank you. Thank you, Ishwara. Uh, there is uh, one senior journalist uh, from Gulf, uh, Sivakumar, Vipulananda Sivakumaran is also on the audience. So he wants to raise a question. Vipul? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, this is, I just want to add to Mr. Jahan Perera's comments on this Buddhism, the, the importance of the interaction between Buddhist monks in uh, Sri Lanka and India. At the same time, I, I must say that uh, there is an issue about this Article 9 of the Sri Lanka Constitution, which gives the state protection for Buddhism, which is a sensitive issue for the people, at least in the Jaffna Peninsula and the Eastern Province. So there are calls now, even when India is helping, I have heard in Tamil forums saying that India should make it conditional to the uh, solving of the 13th Amendment or this Article 9 issues and all that, because while Buddhism is also important, other religions also Sri Lanka should give. I mean, I mean, like, uh, like if they are going for a referendum on this 21st Amendment Bill, there are there are requests for include this type of issues, which Supreme Court will say it needs a referendum. I mean, people supporting referendum to repeal this type of kind of uh, clauses, which kind of hurt the e equality causes. So I just want to add to this. That's all. Any response, Jehan or anybody? Yeah, I, I think if India actually openly says uh, that the aid is conditional on uh, amending Article 9 or the 13th Amendment, it would probably be counterproductive because uh, then it would be seen as having India having some agenda to actually divide the country. This is the great fear of the Singhari, that that the external world wants to divide the country. And it's very easy to mobilize that. Now, at a time when that type of thinking is diminishing, okay. it would be inadvisable to, to I think, bring that, uh, to say it so openly. I mean, what India can do is, India can tell our leaders whom it is support, whom it is helping this privately. It could also fund education programs, on these issues, but I don't think openly India should make their condition because then immediately it will be used by the nationalist side to to create fears among the people, and even the people will start, you know, maybe resenting that because these these are very sensitive issues about uh, about uh, the, the role of Buddhism in in the country. Uh I have a question for Muthu. Uh, having participated in a revolutionary socialist movement, do you think that Sri Lanka will, uh, Sri Lankan politics will be dominated by radical left elements in the coming years? I think uh, now the JVP is the only source for that because JVP now radically, now they are getting their support from the ground, because what uh, my earlier also one of the presenter, Asbijan, 
mentioned that uh, how it reflect in the uh, the election but only thing is uh, I, uh, apart from jvp there is another post called uh, um, revolutionary front there is a breakaway group but these people can gain this uh, uh, the current um, 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 uh, um, protest and uh, and they can come out but the only thing is i am doubt that they can also bring some kind of a radical changes for your information that now uh, even though uh, the sajid's coming from the um, uh, representing the capitalist class of uh, sri lanka then he uh, said uh, that if i come to power i will um, implement uh, the 13th amendment in a uh, uh, fulfill manner but jvp uh, still didn't utter a word about that so therefore we can't see that uh, kind of a radical the thing will but uh, uh, what has happened was because now uh, not like uh, any other country if we even for us take that uh, the the tunisia where the tunisia when the youth suppression was taken place you know the radical Uh, parties especially the left team and the tunisia they also uh, um, take that opportunity and they brought some kind of uh, changes in the constitution even after the constitution was formed even the uh, uh, radical uh, women group also come out and they change the constitution but here i didn't see that type of thing because they also uh, uh, don't have any kind of um, still they didn't submit any kind of uh, Uh, proposal because uh, they are said that if we come to power we can sort out the economic issues but they are not um, uh, submit or propose any kind of a uh, uh, political proposal for the future of the country so that is the one thing another one is i want to comment because regarding the sangha the, the sangha issue is the biggest uh, thing in the political arena in our country but um, Uh, for your information that uh, uh, during the the yapalan government that is the rani period they also initiate some kind of a cultural uh, relationship to, to build because the, um, uh, you know that uh, mythology thing is the nuvaralia sita uh, temple yeah. and build up that temple and link with the um, uh, um, the india and also the, they try to build a a uh, link um, uh, to promote uh, what uh, uh, dr jayan also and dambadi went to dambadi duga they are um, they promote that uh, reducing the flight uh, fare and all that they initiated but that also failed so that type of thing we should promote because another thing is my uh, from the beginning because um, uh, uh, unless uh, we uh, convince the buddhist monks of sri lanka to get it off from the peer then we still we are not in a position to build a good uh, um, relationship with this uh, india because in this crisis one thing india gain especially if we want to thank uh, uh, dr jay shankar is a diplomat career but it was but they failed in uh, during this period also because to get it off from um, uh, china they took this good opportunity uh, uh where the china try to foot on the northern pe- pe- peninsula and also in the eastern province and also china want to cover the ambattota but they were very cleverly he insisted he got signed the agreement to for the maritime and also for these um, what is that called uh, get it off from north and the east there is a good thing already india has gained in the political and also the regional uh, security perspective but there's a failure is the other side the community that gets it over the peer psychosis of the community is the most important thing mm-hmm. so for that uh, and uh, they should invite the buddhist monks there is a special program we should create and also to give mm-hmm. kind of a um, uh, opportunity right. to them to realize what is the federalism uh, exists in india as well as for the uh, the jvp because jvp also from the beginning jvp anti india and they have ideologically that uh, perspective no? but you should in india should cultivate uh, with the <coughs> jvp also to okay. come and see what is happening what is the indian federal system then it should be we should uh, uh, this is a good time to 
to link with both organizations to yes sir thank, thank you. you thank you muttu uh, ashik uh, bonafar is an academic uh, uh, ashik uh, do you have anything to say okay uh, i think minute. i think murari sir wants to murari is yes, no no but i have so uh, uh, and then uh, i think ashik is not responding so uh, mr satyamurthy do you have anything to say thank you right uh, it was a very interesting and uh, informative session as always mm -hmm. i think uh, the focus has shifted all the way away from economic problem to political issue mm -hmm. and political issues are deadlocked unfortunately we have the twin demands of the opposition which can form an alternate government is that both the president and prime minister should go yes the president may, prime minister may lose despite what the deputy speaker election the government may have won i read somewhere a singular translation of a singular news item that still slfp of uh, former president maitri pala sirisena may vote against uh, the government in the no conference motion but still that is going to leave president gota in his place then will the new uh, remaining uh, people come forward to form a government or are you going to have an slpp slfp or this 151 mbs or 148 or 150 mbs going to form an alternate government with a new prime minister how stable is it going to be and no one is talking about the economy in fact even here mainly only mr heblika talked about it and you are quoting extensively from uh, finance minister sir Alisabri, one good thing about this protest is that Alisabri is getting his freedom to act on what he wants, and he is not a finance man, so he is going to take a lot more time. Two, everyone is talking about IMF, etc. IMF is the, we are talking only in terms of about four billion dollars. How long will it help? And interestingly. again as a few people have mentioned other than india no one uh, and possibly i am no one has come forward to uh, pick up any tab on anything china is a, has promised funds but we are told that it is to uh, repay old loan right so in the next i would say at least Two three years is going to be very very difficult economically. Then uh, recovery is going to take another five to ten or uh, even fifteen years. Unfortunately, no one in Sri Lanka, including academics, are talking about it. And okay, let us say this government goes. Does anyone have a economic economic action plan? No. that is the greatest uh, pity of the situation and as we heard and as i have been writing <coughs> we have both jvp and kumar gunaratnam's uh, fsb frontline social party pitching in with the organization for these protests there is a combo i uh, am happy to hear the prime minister mutulingam and also is run that there are all people are uh, agitated even in the interior uh, south etc that is good but in colombo I, i am not surprised by this protest colombo was always anti rajapaksa on the own side that is a pro unb pro uh, sjb right liberal capitalist and the suburbs are uh, jvp and uh, npp that is bimal veeravan sir as we know successive parliamentary election bimal veeravan sir has been scoring getting the highest number of votes from 
Colombo district. So that is not surprising. And if the, this government is to win the conference, no, I mean, do a con, uh, win the con, no conference vote, and they are going to continue, what will happen to this protest? Will the protesters turn violent? Because already today you have a hotel where almost everyone, every uh, organization has chipped in. All government servants have chipped in. But what if under the constitutional scheme, uh, the government continues? There is a dichotomy which no one is talking about. Will the uh, protest then turn violent? If they, the people will get frustrated and from uh, uh, Gulf West Green go back home, that is a victory for the Rajapaksas or whoever, the political club. Uh, it is not just Rajapaksas I'm looking at. The entire political class will be having a large club. And interestingly, none of these protesting organizations are the ever active uh, NGOs and civil society organizations have gone to the Supreme Court asking them to ask the government to get out. Sri Lanka, despite my Sri Lankan, some of my Sri Lankan friends have said, no, no, you, we don't have a credible judiciary. The government, the judiciary proved its credibility in 2018 December when they restored, uh, threw out Mahinda and restored Ranit. No civil society organization doing it. The government is also not going to the to the Supreme Court asking for an order saying or a clarification, there is only one way of uh, throwing out this government. That is through the constitutional means, through parliament. I think that is a uh, I stop. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Satyamurthy. Uh, Mr. Murari. Mr. Murari. Murari was there until now. Uh, there, but uh, I think he's. No, Murari, no. Murari raised his finger also. Uh, Murari? Right. <clears throat> so Sashi can... Uh, yeah, can you... Uh, yes, yes, yeah, you go ahead. There is, we are waiting for you. <laughs> uh, you want to say something? Timothy made a mention about uh, how this government should be got it off. Well, you do have to go to Supreme Court for a direction. Mm -hmm. Parliament is in, already the opposition have to come together for a board of no conference motion. The problem is Mahinda is a prime minister. This government can be removed. President continues. That is a flaw in the constitution. He can only be impeached. That is the uh, lacuna mm -hmm. system. That he has built in uh, into the constitution has made it uh, in private. Nobody can challenge him. That is one aspect of it. Second aspect is it. Even in a crisis like this, I see there is nothing like a national identity in Sri Lanka. 13 years have gone by since the war ended. How did the war end? Mahinda Rajapaksa painfully thanked India for in the war effort. See, the Western powers are out and the LTT was crushed. Fine, done. Excesses were done on both sides. Everything's over. But, but what did Mahinda Rajapaksa promise? Once the LTT menace was got it up from his point of view, 13th, why 13th amendment? 13th amendment plus, plus, plus. But what has it gone? Nothing has happened. The ethnic question remains unresolved. Though equally the Tamils are also affected. You see only a trickle here to Tamil Nadu, 13, 15 people coming together. But the entire population, entire uh, nation in Sri Lanka is in a crisis. Equally, the, 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 the Tamils and uh, others are also equally affected. But they don't have a sense of because they have no power. Only the Sinhalese are still uh, having the situation. That is the situation. And secondly, we, I recall a similar situation in India. We went through a very grave crisis in 1989 when Chandrasekhar was the Prime Minister. We had no money, foreign exchanges, foreign exchanges was in, in the doldrums. We had to pledge our gold to the repatriation of loan. How did he come out of it? Because we had a sense of nationhood. That identity was there. Bangladesh crisis. We, I remember paying, every citizen paid a, a, a tax for that, to take care of the refugees for one year or two years. The sense of participation, accountability is still, even in a crisis like this in Sri Lanka. Everyone is fighting for his own stuff and for his own uh, uh, political objective. At least now, you get this, Tamils also involved, their diaspora is spread all over the world. 
they can chip in with whatever money they can. If you give them a sense of belonging, that justice will be done to them. There will be political power will be done to them. They will be treated as equal. That is all they are asking for. As far as India is giving the, uh, aid, who gives aid without the strings? Tell me. We have talked about PL4, right? I can start all that. Sphere of influence. There's something called sphere of influence. We have acted on our own self-interest. If China comes in, then our security interests will be affected. So we move in and do that. But we are not uh, uh, trying to take over the government or topple the government. Those days are all over. Sphere of influence would naturally be there. You can't have, you give the aid, but you will not be grateful to you or a big brother. That kind of attitude will not help. India is the only country which can bail them out of this condition. That doesn't mean India, all that India will ask for is from the point of view, resolve the Tamil question. The only outstanding is the Tamil question. Then you can solve the, all the problems together. But I think that that mindset is still not there. They are not ready to accept the Tamils as equal, equal. That is the unfortunate aspect of it. Even a crisis, that is the situation. That's my submission. Thank you. Thank you, Bharati. On behalf of uh, President of India, I thank uh, every one of you, especially the panelists and uh, the three uh, the excellent panelists from Sri Lanka, Dr. Jahan, Dr. Kutulingam, and uh, Mr. Iswaran, and Professor Surya Narayan, uh, Sri Heblika, and Arun, so for their uh, insightful analysis. I thank Mr. Sashi also for having giving me an opportunity to anchor the discussion. And I thank uh, the staff of Press Institute of India for uh, having supported this event. Thank you one and all. <laughs>